Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for today's Health Leaders Fellowship webinar. Um, I'm Mar Herman. I'm the Health Policy Specialist here at the Ecology Center, and I'll be your moderator for today. So first up, here is our webinar agenda. Currently, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, please use the chat box to share it. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. And please note that today's webinar is being recorded and materials from today's presentation will be made available tomorrow. So after today's webinar, you will be able to identify ways in which climate change negatively impacts health outcomes and different actions that can be taken to address climate change. And I'm really excited to um, Share today our presenter um, will be joined by Jessica Wolf this afternoon. Jessica Wolf is the U.S. Director of Climate and Health for Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health. She leads the Healthcare Without Harm team in developing strategies to engage and support the healthcare sector in working climate solutions and in becoming a leading voice on climate change. Prior to her current position, Jessica was the Environmental Sustainability Advisor at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health where she worked to develop and drive the system's environmental sustainability program. Jessica worked as a women's health nurse practitioner and health center director for many years. In 2009, she returned for her MBA, focusing on strategy and sustainability, and then held positions at waste management in the recycling and sustainability services. And with that, I'm happy to pass it on over to Jessica for her presentation. Thanks so much, Mara. I am going to get my screen up here. Okay, Mara, I'm using you as my check. See the slides okay? Um, so right now it's back in the presenter mode. So it's showing the notes. Okay, let me change that up for us. As Mara mentioned, my name is Jessica Wolf, and I'm the U.S. Director of Climate and Health for Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health. Um, as Mara talked about in my bio, my, this position for me is really the culmination of a career that was split between healthcare and environmental sustainability work. And I feel very privileged to get to work with hospitals across the country on climate solutions. So let's jump in. Um, healthcare Without Harm is an international nonprofit and our mission is to transform healthcare worldwide to reduce its environmental footprint, to become a community anchor for sustainability and resilience, and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. Healthcare Without Harm um, was founded in 1996, and we have regional offices and partner organizations in 10 countries, and we have an international network of 36,000 hospitals and health centers in 60 countries around the world. Our first campaign was the elimination of medical waste incinerators and mercury. We started in one hospital in Boston, and that initiative scaled to a global collaboration with the World Health Organization. In 2013, the world's government signed the Minamata Convention on Mercury, which committed to the global phase out of mercury in medical devices by 2020. Today, our focus is on climate change, which is the greatest public health threat of the 21st century. Healthcare Without Harm is really a network of sister organizations. Uh, Healthcare Without Harm is an umbrella. And then we have a membership organization called Practice Green Health, which has over 1,100 US hospital members, which represent about 20% of all the hospitals in the country. We then have our Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network, which is how we organize our hospitals internationally. And then in 2016, we launched a purchasing organization called Green Health Exchange, and that was to help hospitals identify, source, contract, and purchase sustainable products and services. 
Our model of change is really three parts. So we innovate, we wanna look at opportunities for healthcare. Then we wanna scale and we do that by, through our practice green health network, by educating, training, opportunities for peer learning and developing um, toolkits and resources for hospitals. And then we aggregate the incredible influence and purchasing power of this sector to influence policy and drive the markets to change for sustainability and climate smart solutions. I wanted to just take a few minutes. This is about a four minute video, um, which really talks about the history of this movement. And I think it's done really well and I think you'll enjoy watching it. So here we go. Most doctors, I began my career by swearing my allegiance to the Hippocratic Oath. As a pediatrician, I was so proud to be part of the tradition of the ancient doctors who swore, in the same spirit as we do today, to treat the sick and protect them from injustice, and above all, to first do no harm. Since the times of Hippocrates, medicine has evolved in unimaginable ways. Inside our clinics, we've become brilliant at treating our patient symptoms. But outside our walls, some of these illnesses are growing to epidemic proportions. Of course, we ask ourselves, what is making people sick in the first place? And why do they keep coming back? In our journey to diagnose and treat the body, we've been to the moon and back many times over. Masters and explorers are very small. But 20 years ago, some of us thought that to understand the problem, we had to take a wider view. From that vantage point, we saw thermometers, each containing enough mercury to poison an entire lake, piled up in our trash. From an even wider lens, we saw medical waste incinerators on our own properties throwing toxic fumes skyward. Dioxins and mercury from waste incineration fell to earth, entering the water we drink and the fish and animals we eat, poisoning our bodies and the developing brains of our children. We're contributing to making our own patients sick, all in direct violation of the oath we had sworn to do no harm. So we formed a coalition of doctors, nurses, and advocates to push back and push healthcare to stand with our oath and clean up our own house. Today, only a handful of incinerators exist in the U.S., and mercury thermometers are going the way of the horse and buggy all around the world. While you listen to me, the climate is changing, and the people we serve face perhaps the biggest harm of all. Now we need healthcare to be a leader within this widest scope. Look at healthcare's global footprint. We consume huge amounts of energy on every continent, contributing to climate change and air pollution that kills 7 million people a year. In the U.S. alone, healthcare is responsible for 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. But here's our leverage. We are 18% of the U.S. economy and 10% of the entire global economy. The changes we make really can move entire industries away from harm and set new norms that will positively impact our patients' health. Imagine, for instance, if healthcare fought antibiotic resistance by purchasing only antibiotic-free meat. greenhouse gases, new norms that will positively impact our patients' health. Imagine, for instance, if healthcare fought antibiotic resistance by purchasing only antibiotic-free meat, or how innovative solutions to eliminating waste, like biodigestion, could help power hospitals and reduce air pollution around the world. Healthcare could help make renewable energy viable. By choosing to turn away from fossil fuel, we would reduce the carbon emissions that harm our patients and our planet. We stand at a turning point in the course of medical history, and we can move to a tipping point. It's within our power and our mission. Dr. Martin Luther King said the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. Join us as healthcare bends toward a more just and sustainable future, rooted in our original oath, do no harm. Okay, 
I turned that volume up at the end. I saw that chat, but when I went to the chat, of course, it stopped the video. So I apologize for those additional technical problems. So I want to start talking about the health impacts of climate change. Climate change causes a wide range of health outcomes. You've likely seen this slide. It's really the gold standard slide from the Centers for Disease Control. The center ring shows the cycle of increasing carbon dioxide, which leads to rising temperatures, more extreme weather, and rising sea levels. The next ring highlights the eight primary global effects, such as extreme heat, air pollution, increasing allergens, impacts on the food and water supply, among others. And the outer ring shows the health impacts, like increased heat-related illness and death, asthma and allergies, cardiovascular disease, and insect-borne illness. Overall, the World Health Organization estimates that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year globally. But not everyone is equally impacted. This slide is from the fourth National Climate Assessment, and it shows examples of populations that are, that are at higher risk of exposure to adverse climate-related health threats. And some of the adaptation measures that can help this, uh, address these disproportionate impacts. So when considering the full range of threats from climate change, as well as other environmental exposures, these groups are among the most exposed, most sensitive, and have the least individual and community resources to prepare for and respond to health threats. The white text on this slide indicates the risks faced by these communities, and the dark text indicates actions that can be taken to reduce those risks. And we can't really talk about the social determinants of health and climate without talking about the systemic and institutional racial injustice in this country and in, in healthcare itself. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist and policy expert who works on building solutions for ocean justice and the climate crisis. This quote, which I really love, is from a piece she wrote in the Washington Post in June that was titled, I'm a black climate expert. Racism derails our efforts to save the planet. And we have to all work on climate within this framework to understanding that our racial inequality crisis is intertwined with our climate crisis. If we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. This slide is from the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and it shows the distribution of impacts across the country. In Michigan, um, where I'm going to zero in for a little bit since that's where you all are located. Climate change is altering seasonal patterns, making hot days more intense, and increasing the frequency of extreme weather events, like the 2014 flooding in Metro Detroit. As a result, Michiganers face a variety of health impacts, including more heat-related illnesses, respiratory and cardiac disease, food and water contamination, traumatic injuries, mental health challenges, and exposure to infectious diseases. In Michigan, Average maximum daily temperatures have climbed more than two degrees Fahrenheit since 1900. Daily summer highs at Detroit Metropolitan Airport averaged 82.3 degrees Fahrenheit from 2008 to 2017, compared with 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit in the 1960s. This historically unprecedented warming is likely going to be seen over the rest of the century, and urban areas like Detroit could be hit especially hard by these extreme heat events. This slide shows the projected number of days per year that exceed, that are projected to exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit by 2041 through 2070, as compared to the 1971 to 2000 period. While temperatures are rising faster in the northern areas, you can see that the southern areas of the Great Lakes region uh, across Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio will see daily high temperatures exceed the 90 degree threshold more frequently because these areas are already closer to those temperatures. And from 2007 to 2016, 61% of Michigander, Michiganders lived in the counties that experienced an average of more than nine extreme heat days per year 
more days than expected based on these uh, local historic averages. This graphic is from Climate Central. And according to Climate Central, more than a quarter million of Michiganders are especially vulnerable to extreme heat. These are people, and we talked about this on an earlier slide, who are children, elderly, people of color, pregnant women, and people with pre-existing medical conditions and people living in poverty. Michigan is protected, projected to have around five times as many heat wave days by 2050 as compared to 2000. Moving from extreme heat, climate change is expected to cause more snow and rain in Michigan, especially in the winter and spring. This includes more extreme precipitation events, which are likely to result in flooding that's more frequent and intense for the state. This data shows the changes in observed events from 1900 to 2014. And unfortunately, this is going to get worse as the impacts of climate change get worse. This map shows projected changes in average number of days per year experiencing heavy precipitation from 2041 to 2070 as compared to the 1971 to 2000 period. And this is assuming that greenhouse gas emissions are going to continue to rise. And as Houghton County saw in 2018, floods like these disrupt, disrupt lives and livelihoods. In addition to damages to infrastructure and homes, extreme precipitation is expected to have consequences for Michigan's agricultural industry. In 2019, Michigan experienced one of its wettest years on record, resulting in uh, the devastation of 870,000 acres of agricultural land going unplanted that season. The wet weather made it harder for farmers to provide for their families and it pushed up corn prices. Every Great Lake has warmed at least one and a half degrees Fahrenheit since 1995, when data became available for all the lakes. And you know, Michigan really feels the impacts of, of many Great Lakes. What happens when you see this warming is that it intensifies some algal blooms. And these algal blooms produce toxins, and it makes swimming in or swallowing this water um, dangerous. It can cause skin irritation, diarrhea, vomiting, and liver damage. Lake Erie has seen a recent increase in bloom severity with record-breaking blooms in 2011 and 2015. In 2014, a severe bloom in the lake made it unsafe for about 500,000 people in Ohio and 12,000 people in Southeast Michigan to drink or bathe in tap water for three days. And in addition to the human health impacts from lake warming, this impacts the fish that, that are found in the Great Lakes, which in turn will impact the local economy. The last uh, climate change health, back, health impact I'm going to touch on is tick-borne illness and, or insect-borne illness. So rising temperatures and changes in rainfall enable ticks and mosquitoes to live in new places and be active earlier in the year. West Nile virus, which is typically spread by mosquitoes, was first reported in Michigan in 2002. And there's been a total of 1,164 cases reported in the state since then. Asian tiger mosquitoes, which is a non-native species that uh, transmits both West Nile and yellow fever, were officially documented for the first time in Michigan in August 2017. And then Lyme disease, which is the most common tick-borne illness in the United States, in Michigan um, there were 1,156 confirmed or probable cases of Lyme disease reported from 2008 to 2016. What this graphic is showing is black-legged ticks. And these black legged ticks, which carry the bacteria that cause Lyme disease, are expanding to new counties. In 1996, these ticks were reported in only 27 of Michigan's 83 counties. This increased to 40 counties by 2015. And based on collection of ticks by Michigan residents, it suggests that these ticks may have spread to an additional, two, an additional 17 counties by 2017. So although people really think about the Midwest as kind of climate safe, you can see just running through some of those really specific to Michigan impacts that climate change is already impacting your home state. So I'm gonna zoom back out now to really a national level. And this is a graphic from the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Association from NOAA, and they do this every year. 
This is looking at billion dollar climate and health disaster events. And 2019 is the fifth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate disaster events have happened in the US. Over the last 40 years, so looking from 1980 to 2019, the 10 years, the years with the 10 or more separate billion dollar disaster events were all in recent times, um, five of them in the last five consecutive years. And now coming to kind of what I really came to talk about, which is healthcare. And healthcare is really on the front line of climate change, bearing the cost of increased diseases and these more frequent extreme weather events. The extreme weather events impact both hospital operations and healthcare delivery. I think we are all only too familiar with these pictures of hospitals evacuating patients during these extreme events. And what's interesting is that while healthcare is adversely impacted by climate change, its contribution to climate change is significant. Last September, we published a study with uh, an international consulting firm named Arup that established the first ever global estimate of healthcare's footprint. The study found that healthcare's climate footprint is equivalent to 4.4% of global net emissions. So if the global healthcare sector was a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. And when we look at our own country, um, the U.S. is the world's second largest greenhouse gas emitter overall, but we are first in terms of healthcare sector emissions, and we account for 27% of the global healthcare footprint. And this can't continue. We need to find a way to decouple growth from increasing carbon emissions. Because what we know is that to meet the needs of the expanding, aging, and urbanizing populations around the world, that health spending is expected to increase at an annual rate of 3.8% globally, 5.5% in the US. So growing from $9.2 trillion in 2014 to $24.2 trillion in 2040. And if such growth isn't coupled with a decarbonization strategy, our footprint in healthcare could easily triple. So what are we going to do about it? And that's where climate smart healthcare comes in. And this doesn't have to be uh, something we're resigned to. We can change that trajectory. So this is our vision for healthcare, for climate smart healthcare. We envision healthcare as a climate smart, innovative sector that protects public health from climate change and accelerates the transition to a low carbon economy while improving community resilience, health equity, and access to care. We believe a hospital cannot simultaneously contribute to climate change and meet its mission to do no harm. This is our, uh, we work with hospitals across the country on a three pillar approach to climate smart healthcare. So mitigation, supporting hospitals to reduce their carbon footprint of their operations, Resilience, preparing hospital facilities for climate impacts and helping to build community health and resilience. And leadership, leveraging the moral, political, and economic influence of the sector to change policy and markets. In 2014, Healthcare Without Harm formed the Healthcare Climate Council, which is a leadership body of health systems that are committed to protect their patients and employees from the health impacts of climate change and become anchors for resilient communities. Healthcare Climate Council members implement, implement innovative climate solutions, they inspire and support others to act, and they use their trusted voice and purchasing power to move policy and markets to drive the transformation to climate smart healthcare. This is really our key strategic vehicle for doing work on climate and health. They, these health systems really serve as our incubator to help us identify and pilot climate solutions that we can then scale to the sector. The Climate Council is currently made up of 19 health systems that represent 500 hospitals in 36 states. In aggregate, they serve 75 million patients annually and employ 1 million people across the country. So I'm gonna move the rest of the presentation through this three pillar framework, starting with uh, looking at mitigation. 
So in the US, um, there was a study done in 2016 that actually estimated the US healthcare emissions at 9.8% or close to 10% of national GHG emissions. That study was able to use very specific country level data. Um, our global study found a slightly lower uh, emissions contribution, but that was because we were using a database so we could look at 43 countries around the world. So of the 10% of emissions that health, the healthcare sector is responsible for, hospitals make up over a third of those emissions. And what this graphic shows you are some of the areas where emissions are produced in the hospital. So hospitals are the second most energy intensive facilities in the country and use two and a half times more energy per square foot than a commercial office space. Hospitals are ranked as the third most water intensive public buildings and they use an average of 570 gallons per staffed bed per day. Water is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions because the energy needed to distribute it, treat it, and heat it. Hospitals also serve a lot of food to their patients and visitors. And since an estimated 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock sector, hospitals can make a big difference by serving less meat. And hospitals generate a lot of waste. The estimate is, that, estimate is that hospitals generate 29 pounds of waste per patient day. And that's just the waste generated in the hospital. The manufacturing process and transportation of the products purchased by U.S. hospitals creates an additional 32 pounds of waste for every pound of product manufactured. This next slide, where the clouds turn from gray to green, show you some of the ways we can address those emissions in the hospital. And I wanted to share a few of the ways we support hospitals in that work. This is um, slides talking about the Healthcare Climate Challenge, which is, a, is an initiative we launched in the lead up to the Paris Agreement in 2015. And it, it was to mobilize healthcare institutions around the world to protect public health from climate change. As of June 2020, more than 200 participants representing the interests of more than 22,000 hospitals and health centers in 33 countries have committed to take meaningful action in climate mitigation, in climate mitigation resilience, and leadership. In the U.S., we require hospitals that sign up to commit to setting a greenhouse gas reduction goal within a year of joining. And we support this work through a greenhouse gas tracking and goal setting toolkit and other resources to reduce emissions across the hospital. I wanted to share this. Um, these are some of the ambitious goals that have been set by Climate Council members. It's been very heartening to see um, health systems, even during this time of COVID, make those connections between these crises and understand that the solutions for COVID are the solutions for climate. Um, Providence Health announced their carbon negative by 2030 goal on Earth Day this year in the midst of the COVID crisis. And this slide actually hasn't even been updated, forgot to do that. Seattle Children's also just uh, announced um, a, a goal of car for carbon neutrality. Okay, moving on to resilience. We think about resilience on a number of levels. Being a climate resilient hospital starts with infrastructure and our building codes and preparation have been based on historical data from FEMA that does not account for climate change. Climate change is bringing more intensity, which means that our infrastructure design thresholds are being exceeded. Temperatures, wind velocities, flood elevations are higher than we predicted and designed for. And the weather is lasting longer. So our assumptions about the length of time that hospitals must be able to function without resupply or aid from the community are no longer accurate. I'm gonna walk us through a few case studies that we cover in a white paper published in 2018 with PricewaterhouseCoopers called Safe Haven in the Storm, Protecting Lives and Margins with Climate Smart Healthcare. This paper was written for a healthcare executive audience and can be used by climate champions and facilities to make the business case for climate resilience to their leadership. The first example is from Superstorm Sandy, which hit the East Coast in 2012. And NYU Langland Health thought they were ready. They had a 12-foot seawall. 
but there was a 14 foot storm surge that left them unprepared. They had to evacuate 322 patients. Their emergency department was closed for 18 months. During that time, 500 providers sought privileges elsewhere while the hospital rebuilt. And they lost invaluable research, including 10,000 lab mice, for which they were only reimbursed for the book value of the animals. That didn't include all the work that had gone into developing the breeds, and, and th those costs were estimated between $20,000 to over $100,000 per mouse. So the total cost for this was $1.4 billion, with $400 million in lost revenue. So after Superstorm Sandy, NYU Langone rose to the challenge of becoming more resilient. They have become a leader in resilient and sustainable design with a new combined heat and power plant. They've moved critical infrastructure to higher floors and put in significant campus perimeter protection and flood prevention measures like submarine doors that close between the buildings so interconnected buildings won't flood. And NYU Langone Health has not only made their own facilities more resilient, but they've shared their lessons learned with the broader healthcare community nationally and they've been an active participant in both the municipal and state climate resilience planning. My next example is from Texas Medical Center. And um, back in 2001, Hurricane Allison brought a thousand year flood that left three feet of rain, 22 people dead and $5 billion in damages. All of Texas Medical Center's 23 hospitals were shut down. There was a multitude of factors that contributed to the closure of the facilities, such as the housing of vital utility and mechanical controls in the basement, and insufficient infrastructure to fortify against flood damage. In the aftermath, Texas Medical Center invested $50 million to upgrade infrastructure with resilient and sustainable design features, like an on-site combined heat and power plant, and moving all their critical infrastructure above projected flood elevation. These new systems have been tested with Hurricane Rita in 2005, Ike in 2008, and Harvey in 2017, and they've been successful. During Hurricane Harvey, which was the largest rain event in US history that flooded the entire Houston area, all of the Texas Medical Center hospitals and emergency rooms stayed operational. But their success was somewhat limited because many patients and emergency vehicles were unable to reach the complex because of massive flooding in the Houston streets. Texas Medical Center had been working with local authorities to improve resilience within the city and county, but the impact of the storm made it clear that it's not enough just to keep the lights on in the hospital, but that hospitals need to work with the community to ensure that patients and staff can get there. So to address the need for hospitals to be connected to the community, we held regional resilience summits to bring together health system leaders with government agencies, community organizations, and other relevant stakeholders to catalyze collaboration and leverage healthcare's role in anchoring community health and resilience. We have held summits in Boston and Cleveland, and we'll be holding one virtually in Southeast Florida this December. So hospitals need to be able to take care of people both during and after extreme weather events. Vulnerable populations will be disproportionately impacted by severe weather, and they depend on hospitals in their communities as a safe haven. After the disasters that caused severe damage to communities, hospitals need to be open to keep residents employed so communities can recover. After Hurricane Katrina, the main safety net hospital in that area didn't reopen, which likely contributed to some of the climate migration we saw after that event. But staying open is still not enough. Hospitals need to support the systems that the community relies upon and to start to address the chronic stresses faced by their communities that make them more vulnerable to climate change. This is a graphic from the National Climate Assessment from 2016. Um, and it shows how climate change acts as a threat multiplier for all of the other social determinants of health. The left side boxes provide examples of social determinants of health that uh, are associated with climate vulnerability. Increased exposure, increased sensitivity, and reduced adaptive capacity all affect vulnerability to climate impacts and health outcomes. 
So right side boxes provide examples of the implications of social determinants on the disproportionate impact from the climate stressors. So for example, people living with limited economic resources in areas with deteriorating infrastructure are more vulnerable to climate related health effects and are less able to recover following extreme weather events. People with underlying health conditions like asthma are more likely to have an extreme problem more likely to have a problem with extreme heat. And we know that asthma is more prevalent in children and communities of color. And we've seen this same disproportionate impact on people who have been exposed to pollution and have respiratory issues uh, with COVID-19. So how do hospitals, it's, it's nice to say hospitals need to build community resilience, they need to be, do more than be a safe haven, but, but how do they do that? So I wanted to share a few examples of what health systems are doing on the ground. So I want to start with Cleveland, where there's been a lot of innovative work being done and supported by hospitals as anchor institutions. In 2008, a working group of Cleveland-based institutions, including Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, as well as Case Western Reserve and the city government, launched something called the Greater University Circle Project. And the goal was to create living wage jobs in six low-income Cleveland neighborhoods. The initiative was designed to build a local economy from the ground up. So rather focus on, rather than focus on workforce training for employment opportunities that are largely unavailable, the Evergreen Initiative first created the jobs and then recruited and trained local residents to fill them. So the Evergreen Cooperatives of Cleveland have started three worker-owned businesses, and that was possible because the anchor institutions guaranteed of the products and services being offered by the companies. The evergreen coppers have become a global innovation model for creating more sustainable regional economies. Another innovative program from Cleveland is their Neighborhood Climate Ambassadors Program, which was funded by a national and local foundation and so also supported by Cleveland Clinic. These ambassadors learn about what can be done in their own neighborhood to prepare for and reduce climate impacts including efforts to reduce the risk of flooding, improve the quality of neighborhood green spaces, reduce energy bills, and how to help neighbors in the event of a heat wave. Another project I'd like to tell you about is called the Anchors for Resilient Communities. And this is a multi-stakeholder initiative that's co-coordinated by Emerald Cities Collaborative and Healthcare Without Harm, which brought together the anchor institutions and community organizations in East Oakland and Richmond in Northern California to understand and collectively address the challenges faced by these communities. The poverty in East Oakland and Richmond is more than double their county averages. People of color living in the flatlands of East Oakland live an average of 10 to 15 years less than whites living just 1.3 miles away in the Oakland Hills. It's a shocking statistic. They live 10 to 15 years less than white people living 1.3 miles away. This really speaks to your zip code being more important than your genetic code. So this initiative is really focused on addressing uh, both the economic and environmental determinants of health with a focus on expanding community wealth and ownership, improving health outcomes, and strengthening the capacity of communities to be resilient in the face of climate and economic disruption. This is, these types of initiatives take a long time and they brought together a stakeholder table and that table identified the opportunity to build resilience by localizing the food economy. The hospital's involvement was as, an, as a community anchor to aggregate demand for healthy food products, to increase community access to healthy foods, to create jobs for community residents, and to increase markets for local producers. We know that local purchasing brings economic wealth, which helps communities rebound economically after extreme weather events. 48% of revenue from local businesses gets redistributed in the community, compared to 13.6% from chain businesses. And we also know that more sustainable on-farm practices make a difference in the impacts of extreme weather. You might remember that there were toxic exposures from industrial animal farms in North Carolina after a 2019 flooding event. 
So the actual art project, which should be opening in the next couple of months, is a 56,000 square foot facility for food processing and meal preparation, along with a food business incubator. It's the, the food processing center will produce 200,000 healthy, locally sourced, locally sourced prepared meals that will be purchased by hospitals, school districts, senior centers, and military personnel. The venture will start with uh, 20 plus union employees and plans to grow to over 250 employees. And they've also made a commitment to transition to community ownership within 10 years. The facility will source millions of pounds of locally grown sustainable food, and they have the ability to do something called forward contract with growers and producers. So that would help provide security for smaller operations or smaller farmers who want to ramp up to be able to serve the institutional market. So moving on to leadership, and um, you can see that these three pillars overlap and intersect. You know, the work I just talked about that's happening in Cleveland and Northern California is clearly leadership work. So as I dive into this last pillar, the focus is really going to be on examples of advocacy work um, that we do with health systems and health professionals. So we are still in. This is a cross-sectoral movement that was formed in June 2017 in response to the current administration's plans to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. Prior to the summer of 2018, there were only two or three health systems that were signed up under this businesses and investors category. So we worked with the We Are Still In Secretariat to launch a healthcare pillar in the lead up to the Global Climate Action Summit in 2018. And we now have 28 health systems that represent over a thousand hospitals in this movement. We also work with a broad coalition of health and medical organizations to do work at the federal level. Um, so that, that coalition called the Healthy Air Partners is convened by the American Lung Association. And we advocate for climate and health solutions to defend bedrock environmental health policies like the Clean Air Act. And as you know, um, environmental policies have really been rolled back, you know, over, probably over 100 of them at this point. And on the federal level, we also work with um, our Climate Council members. So we visited Capitol Hill with our Climate Council members in 2018 and 2019 to meet with members of Congress and committees to talk about the need to transition to clean renewable energy and to ensure our healthcare infrastructure is climate ready. And if you have not seen it, on June 30th, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis released their action plan for solving the climate crisis. This is a 538 page report, which I have to admit I have not read cover to cover, but it's broken down into different topic areas, including a health section. And we were able to provide significant input to the staff of the committee and we think the recommendations in this health section are very, very strong. And we think it really provides a national policy roadmap for Congress for climate smart health care that we're hoping to support when that opportunity arises. We also work with our health systems at the state level. So we work with individual health systems and hospitals to um, participate in advocacy days, to write letters to support climate smart policies and oppose rollbacks, and to write testimony and op-eds. Some examples of this work, including hosting a clean energy roundtable for policymakers in Ohio at Cleveland Clinic, bringing physicians and hospital representatives from Mass General Brigham in Boston to advocate for clean energy and clean transportation in Massachusetts, and working with health systems and health professionals to support the clean buildings and clean energy bills in Washington. In states that are leading on climate policy that have ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets and supportive governments, we've started to form statewide healthcare climate alliances. These alliances are to engage health systems as consistent voices in the legislative and regulatory processes to advocate for climate smart policies. And we currently have alliances in California, Massachusetts, and Washington State.
We also work with health professionals on climate and health advocacy. We have a national physician network which supports emerging and established physician leaders in leveraging their influence and expertise to advance the growing healthcare sustainability movement and, transition, and the transition to climate smart healthcare. The physician network brings physicians together to share best practices and to inspire one another in advocating for a sustainable and healthy future. In May of 2018, we partnered with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments to launch the Nurses Climate Challenge, calling on nurses to educate 50,000 health professionals on climate and health. The Nurses Climate Challenge offers a comprehensive toolkit with all the resources nurses need to educate colleagues on climate and health so that they can engage in climate smart practices in their healthcare settings and at home. And we have already educated over 15,000 of, of, of health professionals through this challenge. We also work with a number of clinician climate action groups across the country and more are forming you know, on, on a regular basis. These are groups of health professionals who are using their trusted voice to advance climate uh, and health solutions in their institutions, but also in their state houses. So physicians, nurses, and other health professionals can speak powerfully to the health benefits of clean energy, especially for the vulnerable patients they serve. Healthcare Without Harm works with these groups to host educational events and supports the writing and placement of op-eds and letters to the editor and opportunities for policymaker advocacy. So with that, I am gonna close with this slide for just a little humor value, because for those of us that do climate work every day, we need a little humor value. So what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? You can see on the board all the benefits we get from climate solutions, all these what we call co-benefits to decarbonizing um, our society. So I'll stop there and um, pass it back to Mara and see if we have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And like Jessica said, yes, we are moving into the question and answer portion of today's webinar. So please be sure to send in your questions. Um, Jessica, just to get us started um, and kick us off, um, what would be the one action that you would suggest for health professionals that want to get started within their own healthcare institutions um, and getting involved in climate action that way? Yeah, I think um, it's so important to work inside the four walls of your institution to make change. And there are different ways to do that, and it depends on the type of institution you work in. You know, we primarily work with hospitals, but more and more of healthcare is moving into outpatient settings. So, um, you know, if your institution doesn't have a green team, that sounds pretty basic, but those are really powerful ways to get started because what you're doing is building ownership and bringing stakeholders to the table. So I think that that's a good place to get started. I think the next step is to think about, you know, bringing in some kind of structured checklist in the different areas where you can try to make a difference. And Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health have good re uh, resources for hospitals. And then there is a, uh, an organization or an initiative called My Green Doctor that does a good job providing resources for outpatient facilities. Great, thank you. And then another question um, you mentioned specifically around climate change impacts that are being felt here in Michigan and then along and um, the greater Great Lakes region. Um, what is a way that you would suggest kind of approaching this question about climate change for um, health professionals that live specifically here in Michigan? One of the things that we generally hear, especially from legislators, is that we're not seeing the same types of impacts that, for example, are being felt on the East and West Coast. Okay, so, so your question is that these are the, the impacts are different and, and feel different and look different. So some people feel that this is not a, an issue for the Midwest. Is that right? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. So, so you're asking me what folks can do to help with that? Yeah, yeah. How can folks really help elevate the issue here in Michigan and the, the greater Midwest region? Yeah, I think it's educating people, you know, educating your colleagues, educating your patients, educating your families, educating your policymakers. And, um, you know, Mara will share my slides. 
but there are a lot of good resources out there. You know, uh, Climate Central's got some really powerful graphics, some of which I shared. Galisa, the Great Lakes, I'm not going to remember the whole acronym, but I have slides from them. You know, they, they're really looking at specifically what, what, are, what is happening in Michigan. And I think that is so important. You know, climate change, you have to make it personal and you have to bring it home. So when you understand as, when you, when you look at Michigan and say, okay, extreme heat is an issue, flooding is an issue, insect-borne diseases are an issue, you know that the people you're talking to are going to know people who are impacted. So, you know, those are conversation openers, talking about Lyme disease. And most people will start to know people who've had Lyme disease, and that opens up that conversation. Have you noticed how we've had so many more Lyme disease cases? That's connected to the warming we're seeing and the shifts in the weather we're seeing. You know, when people are talking about damages from flooding or what happened in the economy, you know, your, your economy's in agriculture is such an important piece of the Michigan economy, talking about how climate change impacts directly impacts the economy. Um, and we also know the economy is an important social determinant of health. So I think the other important role is connecting the dots, connecting the dots between climate, community, health, local economy, and all of these other pieces. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come through is, how did you set up your healthcare climate alliances in the three states you listed? Did you work through the hospital associations or were there other um, ways to set that? Um, we set those climate alliances up and hello, Chip Amo. We work with Henry Ford and I'm happy to see you on the call. Um, those healthcare climate alliances came out of our own network. So, um, Hospital associations, based on their mission, tend to, particularly from the policy perspective, be very conservative. They're as conservative as their most conservative member, typically. That's very true on the national level. Um, so we have worked within our own networks, and then when we have leading health systems, they can invite others to join. And what's been very nice about the alliances is it does, does provide some cover for the health system. So even though you know, they are proud members of the alliances. When we are advocating for policies or talking to regulators, we're doing it under this umbrella group. And we have, in our Washington State work, partnered very closely with the Washington State Hospitals Association, and they are important partners, but um, it's been important to be separate and independent. Thank you. Um, another question is, the work the hospital systems are doing is very inspiring. Is there also work happening in mental health systems, like community mental health? Um, mental health seems as if it might be a very important access as people struggle to cope with increasing climate impacts. Yeah, I think we're, you know, I think this, this um, focus on mental health, we're starting to see grow over the last few years. And we certainly see significant mental health impacts from the extreme weather disruptions as people lose their homes, as they, you know, we're all watching what's happening in California right now with the wildfires and then, you know, hurricanes coming up the coast and um, the, the trauma experienced by people from extreme weather events. There's also, we're seeing some real anxiety and stress, particularly in our young people related to what they see as impending impacts of climate change and how it will impact their lives. So, um, you know, we're starting to see more of that. The Lancet Countdown policy brief from last year, or the Lancet Countdown from last year, looked at climate change through the impacts on a child born today. Um, and mental health, health impacts really focused on that. We're starting to see some coalitions of uh, mental health organizations taking a stronger stand on climate, thinking about how to support climate impacts. The Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, which I mentioned earlier, there are a number of uh, mental health societies like the American Psych Psychological Association that have put out statements on climate change and are working on these issues. And there's a fairly nascent effort that's starting to think about with our shortage of mental health providers across the country, how do we train people in the community 
to do pieces of this support, not to take the place of these mental health professionals, but help support these efforts as they become you know, more and more widespread. And going back to something that you mentioned earlier about a green team, if you're a health professional and you're working within an institution that already has an, a green team, how would you best approach being um, becoming a part of it? Or if you recognize the fact that your institution does not have a green team, what are some tips that could potentially help create one? So becoming a part of it will be relatively easy. You'll be welcomed with open arms, I'm sure, by whoever's organizing it. Um, and I think that is important too, particularly if you work in a larger institution um, and you have a sustainability director in that institution, you don't want to be working in parallel. You want to be working together. So health professionals can be very important persuasive voices, but it's really important to partner with your sustainability professionals so that you understand what they're trying to do. You can you know, kind of put your shoulder into that work, understand the history, understand the data, rather than you know, choosing your own pet project to go off and work on. So I think that that's important, really in alignment and coordination. And I think if you're starting a group from scratch, ideally, you're gonna get leadership buy-in. Because if your organization doesn't have a green team, doesn't have a sustainability person, you know, and again, this is such a different conversation if you're in a small medical practice versus if you're in a, a large institution. You've really got to make the case uh, for why it's important. And you can make that case on a lot of levels. I mean, I think the mission of healthcare to heal and not harm is a really good start. Um, and the fact that our practices are producing pollution that make people sick. I mean, these very, very basic arguments. And then I think there's lots of benefit from that. If you know you want to put on your business hat and think about cost savings, brand reputation, um, opportunities for promotion for your health system and your and your um, site. I think there's good data to show that it it, it uh, has positive impacts on recruiting and retainment of employees. So there's lots of in, there's lots of benefits to working on sustainability and climate within your organizations. And I think messaging that and getting some leadership buy-in is critical. And ideally, and this takes a while, it's not just one leader, but it can start with one leader. So maybe you know that there's someone who loves to hike and really values the wilderness experience, maybe a COO or CFO in your organization. That's the, the starting point for a conversation. Maybe it's a, you start a book club and you see if who comes to that book club that you're reading books about you know, nature and the environment and climate change. There's lots of ways to start to identify people with that interest. Perfect, thank you so much. And I'm not seeing any other questions coming in, so we'll leave that open in case others do, but in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen. Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today and for your presentation and for your insight and all of the knowledge that you share with all of us. Um, I am now showing uh, my screen to remind folks to please fill out our webinar evaluation. I'm also going to chat out that link in the chat box. Our webinar evaluation is required for all current Health Leaders Fellows. However, we also strongly encourage all other participants to also complete the survey. Um, your feedback is really valuable in helping us plan future meetings and events. Um, and speaking of future meetings and events, we do have another webinar coming up next month. Um, so our next webinar in the series will provide an overview of air pollution sources, connections between poor air quality and health, and how air monitors can help to empower and engage communities. We'll be joined by Catherine Savoy, a Detroit Community Health Director here at the Ecology Center. And I will also chat out that registration link. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today, all of you for also joining us for today's webinar. As a reminder, we'll be sharing all materials tomorrow. And with that, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.